takes care of patients with disorders of consciousness. And I understand that he's going to give us a talk that's really up to date, to the minute. Absolutely. Um, so, I think dealing with disorders of consciousness is a challenge. And I was happy to serve on, on both the American and European guidelines. The uh, ones from the American Academy of Neurology came out. The uh, European Academy are currently being finalized. Uh, I'm happy to share this with you. I think there's um, still a gap between intensive care and uh, the, the neuro rehab societies with their own journals, their own associations, and yet you basically create these artifacts of um, modern medicine. So, first of all, maybe quickly, let's define what are we talking about, these disorders of consciousness after coma. So, by definition, a patient in coma will never open the eyes, classically after a couple of days. Uh, if they survive, they will awaken. And when we only observe reflex movements, this was coined persistent vegetative state. Within the guidelines, this is now proposed to um, be referred to as unresponsive wakefulness, which is a more neutral term, and I think uh, better reflects basically what we see. Next, some of these patients will go to what we call a minimally conscious state. This is actually something you do see in intensive care. It's patients who, again, after coma, awaken, can't <coughs> communicate, yet you have signs that sometimes they are uh, having conscious experiences. So it's very frustrating. We um, also, within the guidelines, subcategorize this and minimally conscious state minus. And these would be the patients that orient to pain or that would show visual pursuit or that will sh would show a emotional reaction. For example, if it's a family member in the room, they would somehow um, show a behavioral response that is different from any other person. But that's all you get. And then the next step is minimally conscious state plus. That's the patient who actually responds to a simple command in a reproducible way, but you can't establish a functional communication. That is the next step um, where patients emerge and, of course, then can express their uh, wills and wishes and their right for self-determination. Neuroimaging shows that the brain in these different conditions, coma, unresponsive wakefulness, MCS minus plus, is different. Um, of course, we're biased at the bedside because our consciousness test is very simple. You know, move uh, your arm or whatever, and if we see it, fine. If we don't, well, we've not really proven they're unconscious. And also, language plays a major role. That's what you see on the image patients who will not answer response to command, but yet are minimally conscious, uh, classically have left uh, dominant in the uh, language network uh, a damage that maybe permits them from understanding you. Uh, we're talking here within the guidelines of patients who are in this condition for more than 28 days, but I will try to emphasize what I think is interesting for you uh, as an intensive care physician. So this is not the official standpoint, but kind of my summary of this. And um, of course it starts with getting the diagnosis right. And this is tricky. Um, studies have repeatedly shown that uh, vegetative state, say unresponsive wakefulness, is a difficult diagnosis. And in about one third of the cases, we think that there's nothing going on in the mind of these patients, and yet there can be um, signs of consciousness. And they already can be um, seen if we use the appropriate scale. So it's not the Glasgow Coma scale that's uh, going to help here. There are other scales, but very hard to use in intensive care. Coma recovery scale. Um, <coughs> And uh, the reason why we miss these signs of consciousness, well, there's many. Maybe one that can be of interest for you is the way we assess. The first signs of recovery of consciousness often is visual tracking. And I think all of us, we just move an object, like our pencil, our finger. And we now know that if we simply use a mirror, many more patients will actually track, show visual tracking. 
and that's not a big investment, that's not high tech. So I think we should all have a little mirror when we're seeing patients on intensive care surviving coma, opening the eyes, and we're trying to know are they having visual pursuits. Um, also in the guidelines is um, the uh, fact that patients fluctuate. And so this is important also for you. You can't just see your patient and think, well, that's it. It can be different an hour later or in the afternoon. And so this study uses long duration EEG, measuring arousal, probably also picking up awareness. And what you see is, is just a, a measure of uh, spectral entropy, but basically we see them going up and down, in this case, about every 70 minutes. And so these might be windows of opportunity for us to see that there might be something of a sign of consciousness, response to command, but, you know, it is very frustrating because if you're not there in the right moment, you will simply miss it. That means that we need to do repeated assessments. And so this is um, well shown now that you can't just walk into a room and a little bit in an arrogant way come out and say, you know, patients, vegetatives, nothing. Uh, if you do that, well, you will miss many of these patients. In this study, you uh, should see them at least five times to be able uh, to make this diagnosis of unresponsive wakefulness slash vegetative state. Um, I don't think this is very useful to you, but somehow it emphasizes how careful we need to be at the bedside. So if we take um, an automated measure, and we heard earlier today about um, pupillometry, and so clearly we're going more and more in, in measuring objectively our clinical signs. So is the pupil reacting to light, yes or no? Machines do it better than the human eye. This is actually the same for response to command. And so here we just used, actually this was done first in Cambridge, you put electrodes and you ask the patient to move, you don't see any movement, but the electrodes picking up, amplifying the signal will tell you, yes, there can be patients where you don't see it yet, it is actually happening. But again, so far this is not yet uh, something that's, I think, commercially available or that can be implemented in intensive care. The same for this, EEG coupled to TMS. Um, very, very exciting. It helps us to better understand brain dynamics connectivity. So basically excite part of the brain matter with um, guided transcranial magnetic stimulation and simultaneously you record the electrical response and you then do complicated calculations. This was developed by the team in Milano. We now do this in Liège on a routine basis, even if it's never really routine in these patients. And currently, I think the technology is not permitting yet to have this in our uh, real-life clinical settings. But it, again, helps us to grasp, to, to um, measure something um, regarding a residual mind and brain function in patients after coma that we cannot uh, sometimes measure with our classical bedside assessment. The same for positron emission tomography, active fMRI. So really this is um, showing us how careful we need to be, that we've historically been underestimating in some patients what's going on in their mind after coma, but yet this is not something that will uh, in the near future be used in ICU. After the diagnostic channel, uh, challenges, prognostic, um, challenges were, again, I think we have been a little bit nihilistic and considering these group of patients of chronic disorders of countries is basically um, waiting to die and the label persistent slash permanent vegetative state um, had a very negative connotation. Now we do know that not all of them will die. Etiology is very important and you see here in this table I think interesting data regarding some late recoveries slash um, late discoveries because um, that difference is not always easy to make. But the guidelines also show that prognosis is better in minimally conscious state patients and that we start to have some evidence regarding pharmacological treatment. There is a wonderful controlled clinical trial published by the group of Joe Gizzino using amantadine uh, four weeks after traumatic brain injury 
this image just shows you what this drug does. It will activate the um, cortical networks you see here, as shown by PET imaging. And so it's good for you to know that, well, this could be considered in traumatic brain injury patients who after four weeks are still showing no functional communication. And then uh, a lot of uh, discussion regarding the ethical implications of all this and of course the very difficult questions regarding end of life. And uh, as a society it's important to emphasize that we should try to uh, respect the patient's individual wishes. And when we looked uh, within Europe for um, the physician's uh, feelings about stopping artificial hydration and nutrition in this case for patients considered to be um, in a chronic unresponsive or minimally conscious state, you clearly see that there is a difference in the response uh, depending whether you're in the north or in the south of Europe. And of course, religion plays a big role there. So it's a challenge, but I think it's important um, as a society that, that we address this. Um, it is also important, I think, to push um, citizens throughout Europe to think, what do I want when I am in this condition? It is tricky, and it is especially so because there's something like the disability paradox. So we basically want to know what it is like to be in this minimally conscious state, for example. Uh, but by definition, you can't ask them because they can't communicate. So what we did here is ask the question uh, to locked-in syndrome patients, so you cannot be more motor handicapped. They were um, months, years after their brainstem lesion, uh, artificially fed, uh, anarchic, uh, cadriplegic, and we asked about their quality of life. And these are the results, very surprising, uh, on a score from minus five to plus five, many of these patients did um, self-report a life worth living. So this is indeed the disability paradox, when something happens to you, well, you can adapt to that new situation. And so that makes it difficult, but nevertheless, I think we should, and this is the only way forward to avoid uh, paternalism is to try to see our role as one of informing, uh, in this case the families, of what is the reality and trying to know what would this specific patient have wanted. And so I think that um, having living wills can help us and maybe more importantly having uh, a person of um, trust that is uh, able to communicate your wishes the wishes of each and every citizen when they no longer can. And so for the same clinical reality, we can make different decisions regarding end of life and um, keeping the patient in the center. Um, also a lot of uh, emphasis in the guidelines is the ethical obligation to be very attentive regarding patient's comfort and possible pain perception. Again, um, when we do surveys asking Physicians, do you think patients in a vegetative state uh, slash unresponsive wakefulness can feel pain? We see that there's a difference, whether it's a nurse or a medical doctor, whether it's a religious uh, caregiver or not. We don't really want to see that, right? It, it shouldn't be um, important whether you're in a, uh, a hospital in, in Rome or uh, in uh, somewhere else. And therefore, we need uh, evidence-based guidelines, also scoring systems uh, such as the one we proposed here. And I will end with this picture that I think illustrates well how careful we need to be also in intensive care. It's not of course because the patient can't tell you I feel pain that he is comfortable. So up here you see um, the pain matrix activating when you and I feel pain and we see the patients in minimally conscious state who sometimes only show um, visual tracking, no way for them to say anything about possible pain, and their brain scans do show us that very probably they are uncomfortable, can feel pain, and so the guidelines propose to, for all of these patients with chronic disorders of uh, consciousness, use analgetics, and I do think it also applies to the intensive care. So, um, in short, all of this is level B, um, so it's proposed to do serial standardized assessments, um, to take into account that when we 
uh, talk about prognosis with also family members. <coughs> it is different, it is better for minimally conscious state patients, it is better for post-traumatic uh, patients, and there is a role for neuroimaging, but that needs to be further um, validated. And we briefly discussed the role of amantadine and the ethical implications, and I thank you for your attention and the team did it. Thank you.